todos me pueden escuchar. Voy a hacer mi presentación en... Ok, can you hear me all? I shall uh, talk in Spanish because I, uh, you know, I lived uh, 20 years in Italy, so my, my Spanish accent actually is more of an Italian one, but hopefully it won't be a problem. So, as I have been introduced, I am a journalist and writer, and I have lived the last 20 years of my life doing research on the Dutch um, volunteers. Uh, in the Spanish Strides, i.e. this project, which is managed by the Social History Institute in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, and it has been conducted thanks to the Dutch Friends Association of the International Brigaders. And here is Cristina Ruiz. Uh, she comes from Aragon after having spent 30 years in uh, the Netherlands, who's helped me with the translation of my discourse. So please, Cristina, if uh, words are, you know, if I lack some words, please give me a hand. I have published two books on the Dutch volunteers in the Spanish Civil War. Okay, so far so good. Right. This is a book on Fanny Schrommet, you know, Dutch always uses My name is Scholten, and she was Schoonheid. Fanny's uh, nickname was the queen of the machine gun. Also, I have published a book on uh, Miss Schenning, who was um, a U.S. Uh, guy who helped with the Lincolns, and he was a singer, actually. He was the singer. He was a very kind man, actually. So, there is this uh, side, Spanischheiders. These 700 uh, biographies of Dutch volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, and amongst them there were 27 women, Dutch women. Most of them being, obviously, who was mostly the case, they were nurses. Two or three I will be talking about in detail afterwards. I was asked to talk about women in general. Here you can see this site, uh, this website, spanschreders.nl, uh, and this is where you can check and get more information on these biographies. You can do a Google translation, which is never okay, we'll know that. And as I was saying, I was asked to talk about women in general in the international brigades, and it's such a broad area, it's a complex topic, it's a little bit difficult, to be honest. In 1939, the International Brigade's archive was sent to the former Soviet Union, and during many, many years, it was totally closed and hidden from the public. However, three years ago, it was op openly published. It's actually online. And as you said, it's, our, it's the Erregaspi. You could devote hours, endless hours. The archive is called RJASPI. And here I found a letter by Gallo, Luigi Longo, an Italian. He was one of the most important commanders of the International Brigade. And the letter is uh, uh, directed for a lady from Strasbourg. And it says, Dear Comrade, for serious military reasons and in view of the experience of the last few months, I have to communicate with you. I'm really sorry. We don't accept any women. If there are women in a battalion, it is decomposed. 
for reasons you could yourself imagine. Dear comrade, I am truly sorry, but there is no place for you in the international brigades, nor are there women accepted in the Spanish militias. They don't accept women either. It is not true. Afterwards, I will talk about Fanny, who participated in the militias uh, right up until 1937, maybe May or July. But this uh, letter by Longo, it's December 1936. So basically, we've said everything about the role of women uh, in the international brigades. And also, we can feel it's important, important to realize how high commanders or the big guys thought about women participation. Indeed, there are few very scarce uh, studies done by um, uh, on, on this topic, on the role of women. But in many countries, in a few countries, sorry, there have been some studies carried out uh, such as the Netherlands, the US, in Latin America, in Austria. There is also a very nice uh, book on Belgian women, which is titled, give me a second. This is the Longo letter, sorry. Uh, this is my first PowerPoint presentation, so I need to get organized. This is the letter, which you can find in Ergaspe, in the archive. This is the book I was mentioning on Belgian women. In Spanish, Cristina means... Yes, in Spanish, it will be published in December. In German uh, language, two books have been published. They are quite general ones, Frauen uh, into Spanish and Grich, which means um, women in the Spanish Civil War. These were two um, daughters by a German volunteer, Luxitz, und Spanier Kämpferinnen by the Austrian René Lukchitz. And the first one includes short biographies of a few thousand women from all over the world. The problem is that it doesn't have an index, so it's quite hard to, to use it, actually. And the second one, by René Lukchitz, is much more theoretical. And many of her conclusions actually coincide with those by Mary Nash, the US writer who wrote about the Spanish women in the Civil War, which is titled Define Male Civilization. Cristina, how would you say this in Spanish? Desafiar. A la civilización. <laughs> and both, actually, both writers actually stated or realized the great difference between the first um, months of the war from July to September 1936 and afterwards when the popular, the people's army was created. And uh, in the regular army, there was no place for women, as Gallo said. In the previous uh, months, in the militias, women actually played an important role. And it was actually devoted, uh, many attention was devoted to them. Women who took up arms were, of course, a new phenomenon. But afterwards, when their arms were taken away from them, new tasks were given. Please see this postcard here. It's quite clear, isn't it? The postcard says, women, work. There were also big differences between the political groups, the anarchists and the POUM, which uh, were more favorable to accepting women and the communists, socialists, and republicans. Lukšić, in his book, in her book, sorry, analyzes the image of 
that was had of the that she had that was given of women and it doesn't always coincide with reality. It's a classic image of the woman, that of a dedicated person, devoted, a woman who gives comfort. But it underestimates the fact that many, especially women in the international brigades, they chose uh, you know, to come here because of political reason, because of uh, their anti-fascist ideas. We talk about women in Spain. There's always this idea of a nurse. But women did have some organizing roles. They worked in the healthcare service. And also, on the front, there were translators, journalists, photographers, and so on and so forth. After the disappearance of the militias, that women fighters who were previously praised and admired, then they were started to be seen as a problem. In the so-called characteristics or features, which were the lists of behavior assessment or evaluation of conduct of the volunteers, in the case of women, there were, a li there were lists of aspects, personal aspects of their love life, for example, which was one of the characteristics that would never be listed for men, right? For example, uh, Frida Schiff, a um, German woman who lived in Moscow for, five, for six years, for six years with a black man. The, this detail would never be found in a, in a man's uh, list. And our question is why? So sexism and racism were not yet topics of discussion or topics of debate. After this general park, I would like to say more things about Dutch women, some Dutch women, as I said. Most of them were nurses. Their biographies can be found. Of these 27 women, all the biographies are in the Dutch website. And you can see in these biographies a big difference in their backgrounds, origins, and political reasons. Most of them were communists, that's true. But there were some socialists, social democrats, POM followers or POUM followers and women who had no political affiliation whatsoever. I decided to tell you about the three Dutch women who were not nurses. The first one of them, of them is a woman named Fanny Schoenheit. The press back then, at that time, and we're talking about the year 1936, Fanny, the Dutch woman, was really popular. She was really popular at the press back then. She was considered, oh, by the way, this is another Dutch woman, Lini. I will tell you about here Lini Bunez, another militian member. I will tell you more about this lady later on, but let us come back to Fanny. Fanny was very popular. She was a fighter, the woman fighter. And we can see that in some interviews that were done with her. An example, for example, was the interview published in La Vanguardia, a Catalan newspaper, on the 28th of August of 1936. They were talking to the military chiefs who direct the operations on the Aragonese front. And then we find Coronel Vilalba, who says, we have a, a column, or we have a Dutch woman that we have baptized the queen of machine gun, guns. She stole, blonde, beautiful, and her name is Fanny. She's not a tomboy at all. She is a little woman who's discreet, kind, and very, very feminine. She's the most admirable woman on the front. The other day, she had to load 
a machine gun, and she had to walk three kilometers under the very strong Aragonese sun. From the effort, she fell ill, and she was taken to hospital. But she didn't then ask, as people normally do, some few days to recover for convalescence. After some restful sleep, she came back to the front. That was written then. But in December 1936, Fanny was again at the hospital, and she was interviewed again by a journalist. She was interviewed so many times. This time, the journalist also worked for La Vanguardia. But rather than an interview, this seemed, the thing that was published was a declaration of love, really. Fanny Schoenheit, I need to say that this journalist was the only one who was able to write her name properly. And according to the journalist, Fanny was as follows, blonde hair in which no oxygen played any role, naturally blonde, just blonde. And then blue eyes, blues as in a northern lake or a southern sky, right? And then the journalist continues with this. He was fascinated, and this is fascinating, right? He, of course, then says how brave she was, how determined she was to come back to the front again. Fanny arrived in Barcelona two years before the war, but back then she was working for a liberal newspaper in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, but then she realized that she would not be able to go beyond being a secretary. In Barcelona, she expected to be able to work as a correspondent, but she did not succeed. And in these two years in Barcelona, um, she started writing down letters to a friend in Rotterdam. This can be found in the Amsterdam archive. And in these two years, her political interests were clearly going towards the left. And finally, she ended up in the PSUC, the political party. I do not know how it was, but she finally ended up that political party because she was always, after the war, very mysterious about her own life in Spain. Very quiet, very silent. She didn't say a word even to her daughter. She never told anything about her life, not even to her daughter. She was a member of the PSUC. And that is something that I have double-checked. And uh, then she was again to the hospital again. Marina Ginesta. Marina Ginesta is a woman I interviewed about 10 years ago when she was 90 years old. But she told me that this was the case. 90 years old. But she was so wonderful. Marina, this young girl of this iconic photography you have on screen, was this woman with the machine gun, right? And as she said back then, that was the only woman of my life, she said, that I had a rifle in my hand, that I have a machine gun in my hand. Marina was 16, and she met Fanny, who was 30, 23 years old. Marina looked up at her with admiration. She admired her as a modern, independent woman, a woman who, oh my god, she smoked cigarettes on the street. And that was exceptional then. In spring 1936, Fanny, like many young people in Barcelona, was in charge of the preparations of the People's Olympiad in Barcelona. As you all know, these Olympic Games of Barcelona, these People's Olympic Games, um, were being prepared back then. And that was that moment in which Fanny Fanny was trying to start and decide to join the militia and fight with her friends with whom 
She was preparing this people's Olympiad. Fanny immediately joined the, the ranks of the militias, and in a letter to her friend, she starts um, telling her friend about these first days in Barcelona. She participated in the um, assault uh, of, and, she, and she went out to the front of Tardienta, and that's where she made the name of, well, that's where she was called the queen of the machine guns, right? Because she was really, really brave at that time. At the beginning of 1937, after the disappearance of the militias and the creation of the Popular Army, Fanny then joined a pre-military training camp, a camp that was pretty close to Barcelona. And according to several documents that I have checked, she was a director of the camp, manager of the camp, and even a lieutenant. However, I have asked several historians, several Spanish historians, about the possibility that she was a lieutenant, and they all deny it. They say that this is not possible, a foreign woman in the people's army, no. They say no. I actually have no explanation for that because the, she is described as holding this rank in the army in several documents, and I will need to skip some parts of my presentation. So, my apologies if you want to find out more about Fanny, please look her up because she's a really interesting woman. I'm now only going to talk about the second woman, because otherwise I will not have time for that. So, the second Dutch woman that I am really interested in, her name is Adriana Schreifiger. Hold on a second, I'm going to show you. About here, I don't have any photos, I only have a few documents available. She was born in 1907 and she died in 1942 during the Nazi occupation of Holland. I think Fanny had a great adventurous spirit, but Adriana too, Adriana too. She was in Spain from September 1936 to August 1938, almost two years, and her passport shows that she was constantly crossing the border between France and Spain. However, I don't know exactly what she was doing when she was crossing the, the border so many times. Hold on a second. It's not easy to accelerate my speech. The Jean, as she was called, um, is a woman for whom we have the most interesting information thanks to the research and investigations of the Dutch Secret Service, because she was um, interrogated in September 1938 by the Amsterdam police, and she told a completely fantastic, but also made up or invented story. Of course, it's just a bunch of lies. She said that she went to Spain in order to write a book on the economic situation of the country and in order to work in the radio, Barcelona. I couldn't really find any evidence of whether they were broadcast in Dutch. I, I don't think this is likely. They were certainly broadcast in German, but probably not in Dutch. In the interrogation, she said that she had no political interest whatsoever and that she, did, she does not belong to any party. But it turns out that the police had a file on here, and according to that file, she was a communist, she was in Moscow, in the famous Lenin school, and she also lived without being married with her boyfriend. In 1933, she was fined for insulting the president of the Dutch government. We could say that Jan 
had all the qualities that would please the Comintern officials, the Communist International officials in Barcelona, but that was not the case. There is a document by Gustav Schinda, who was a German volunteer and also a Comintern official, who in 1940 in Moscow collected all the so-called characteristics about German and Dutch volunteers. And Zinda writes devastating things about him. According to him, she has a frivolous behavior. She's too cheerful. She has no class awareness. And the most serious of, of it all is that she has some friendly relations with the POUM people in this paranoid climate of 1937-1938 with the Moscow trials, having relationships with the POUM um, according to the logic of Comintern, was the same as being a traitor and a spy. Out of all these accusations, they could find no evidence. The Communist Party of Spain wrote a letter to the Dutch party asking that this woman was so dangerous that she had to be removed from, from Spain, expelled from Spain. And I need to finish, but the two women, as all Dutch volunteers, both of them lost their nationality. They were not national citizens of um, the Netherlands anymore. And not only that, their names, the name of these ladies, the name of these women volunteers were included in the list of the secret police of the Holland. With the occupation of the Netherlands, these lists of these subversive people ended up in the hands of the Gestapo. So many Dutch fighters ended up in concentration camps. So Jan was arrested and tortured in 1942, and she committed suicide in prison. She was only 35 years old.